quick one, a fun one. I'm going to tell you that I've seen this done in elementary schools. So with this, it is interactive. A lot of times it's going to be paired. Sometimes when you get into bigger groups, it could get uh, a lot of times the information could get a little overwhelming. But paired, you can make sure that they get really, really into it. A lot of these structured discussions are better with text. They don't have to go with text, but they're better with text. As much as we can get students to rely on the text and have it with them, I want them to automatically pick up their textbook and a highlighter and some sticky notes. And I want them to walk around like this when they're going to meet with other students with their stuff. We might have to get like a little packet with text, uh, cards, sticky notes, highlighters. Can we make some pockets like that and give out to kids? I want them to do that even when they're traveling around the room. So this one we're going to get up for, and it is essentially give one, get one. You're going to give someone some information, and you're going to get some information. There are times I've had students do this with Cornell notes. They had all their information already written down. They might give them a piece of information. Students might scribble out something that they wrote that was wrong, or they might check mark something that they have, and then they get some information. They might do this where they've already, maybe they did these, this graphic organizer on cards with some factual information, and they actually give the card. Students don't like to give up their stuff, so I've even had kids where they've initialed their cards, so they got them all back at the end. Because then the one that you get, the kids can go and copy it down if they need to and make sure that they have that information. So some students don't like to give up their stuff. So in a minute, we're going to stand up, and I'm going to ask you just to take that information, and when you go and meet up with someone, you can give them something from the conversation that really um, sunk into you. Um, suck in with you and you might then share with them you know in paragraph five we talked about this in my group and this kind of really stood out to me and I wanted to share this and then that person is going to reciprocate and everybody will walk away with either new information or some clarification on information and maybe even a new take on some of that information okay everybody ready give one get one so when you meet up sometimes I'll put on some music we'll see if my music comes on uh, as you walk around and one of the things I like to do as a facilitator in my classroom to make sure that students are moving and not standing with the friend that they've been talking to for the past 30 minutes, I have them stand up, hold their hand up. If you would demonstrate with me, please, Jennifer. Sure. You hold your hand up. Now, some kids don't like to touch and do high fives, but I'll have you do a high five. But in a classroom where kids don't like, we do an air high five. <laughs> so it's a high five. So their hands down, then one will start sharing give one, the other one will get one. Okay. And then when they're done, they need to hold their hands up and walk around to show others that they're available. Okay, as a facilitator, I can see students are moving. <laughs> All right, sounds good? Okay. All right, we're gonna stand up. So, just so You're gonna take your graphic organizer with you <laughs> and your piece of text. I, I, they might be on the same side, yeah, I think I tried. Okay, I tried to do that. Yeah. So you're gonna take that with you. So that, like I said, if you're in a classroom where there's opportunity to write down information, I have a lot of clipboards in my classroom too, so we, we use everything. So you're going to do hands up, and you're going to pair up with someone, walk around, pair up, music is playing, music is playing, because I didn't get over there and push my button. Music is playing, match up with someone. All right, and someone decide to give first, and then in about a minute, the other person will then give. Give one, get one, and go. To get you an idea of how to do give one, get one, how'd you like that? So one of the first models that I use when I've seen this is uh, it's a one from an elementary school, and it's a little lady who is just like about this tall, but she's coaching the other student, and she's like, okay, now you, you, you tell me. And she's telling the other student, mm hmm, mm hmm. And she's listening very attentively, mm hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, now give me a high five. Okay, now you go to another person, okay? So I show that to my high school students when they think they can't do it to show them to say, hey, uh, if this little elementary school group can do this, then I expect for you all to be able to do this give one, get one without any problems. So they're kind of shamed into doing it right. And I love that. Using, so every time, every time I start off with this, I'll show that example. And they're like, these are elementary school students. Exactly. 
because I want you to know that they can do it, therefore you can do it. So this is one, again, I love index cards, I love sticky notes so that we can take little information and take it back and transfer it to what we need to. And I feel like pairs, giving that information is less intimidating for our students, especially those ones that are a little bit shy. It's okay if they go and talk to their friend the first time, but I want them to have something then to take to someone else. Anyone else see how this might work in their classroom? Mm -hmm. Even a test review. Test review, really, definitely. So it works really good with test review, information they've already gathered, going back and forth, clarified. And I even say, see if there's something that, there's something you need clarification on. You might give something, but then say, hey, do you have the information on this particular thing? I think I missed it. Opportunity for them just to collaborate really quickly and then even go and check it with another person. So they have that opportunity to really dig deep into this. So again, the timing is huge with all of these and making sure that they are frequently moving. Something as easy as a hand up to see that they are moving around the room makes a difference. So again, some of these are short, some of these are longer, like four A's of text takes a little bit more time, but give one, get one might be done be at the beginning of the class period. It might be done as a check for understanding right in the middle. It might be done at the end of each unit that you do. So many different things that we can have to have the discussion going deeper with our students. And who's doing the talking? They are. And the learning, as we're walking around, I'm just facilitating, I'm listening, I'm there to clarify. Hopefully there are times when I've done this with students and they are kind of getting a little heat and they're like, Miss Harris, tell them that paragraph five means of this. And I say, well, tell me what you all said and what is the argument? Okay, so let's think this through. Let's look at paragraph five. And I try to help them to discover it for themselves. But I love that they are getting to the point that they are, I know it says this and I want to argue about this and I'm going to stand on this. But they're using the text. How powerful is that? Read 180 students. A couple years ago, we had the FCAT booklets. And I don't know if you would remember the one about the enigma of the echidna. Yeah, that was one. It was a very, very detailed one. One of the questions, one of the questions uh, asked about what these people were doing on this island with this animal. The two of the answers were exactly the same except one word. One was study and one was classify. Were they there to study the animal or were they there to classify it? So I had students who kept rereading and this kid kept saying, I don't see anything about them classifying this animal. And they were like, no, they had to be. They're not doing all of this to study an animal. They had to be classifying it. But that kid was correct. They were only there to study it. We looked at what they looked at and everything, and he stood by it. And we kept looking at that section. Those kids finally got to the point, okay, he is right. They were here to study it. So when we get kids to go to that text and they're going back and forth, and like I said, we, we were doing that give one, get one, then they had to sit down because it became a debate. I loved it. I just stood back. I was like, forget the give, give one, get one. They're getting into the text. Go for it. So that's really what we want them to spark that authentic discussion where you're kind of just standing there like, this was not my plan, but this is going great. Let it go. So many things that we could do with these to make them our own, but it's really making sure that the students are doing the talking, the students are doing the learning, they are taking ownership, they are truly, they don't realize that they're learning the standards when they're doing this, but then when you go over their standards, they're like, oh, that, okay, I, I know how to cite, uh, okay. I got this, I got this. So they might not know them verbatim, but they are getting into them and being able to apply them, and that's really what we want. Give one, get one is one of those that you're actually supposed to get up and walk around with. I know that some teachers are not comfortable with students getting up, but I believe that part of the engagement in a classroom is allowing them some freedom and allowing them to walk around. And the real idea behind that is for a student to take ownership of their learning and then share that learning 
and get some learning from someone else. So when they take ownership and they have that empowerment, I just truly believe that it solidifies their learning and even builds their confidence when they can share that with someone and they're confident enough to put that on there to say, hey, this is my view. I'm backing it up with text. Now let's hear yours. Fishbowl. I love this one. This again, used as that structured opportunity. This one, I'm gonna talk you through it because I have a video to show you on this one. This one is more so where you might use the question stems. I, I kind of put some things up around the room to show you some uh, things that I would do. I put up some question stems that we could use for fishbowl. A lot of times what I would do is take these, have them miniaturized and have a fishbowl there. They drop them in there. And if we have a topic, it might be a topic of the day that we're doing today. Students might pull it out. I make sure it's uh, relevant to the standard. But it might be for bell work, where I really want them to get into discussion, really just how we did with the classics. I might have that topic or that question or that statement that I want them to hit on. And I say, hey, everybody make a statement related to this. And or if we just did this piece of text, OK, you've read credit card heaven. Go ahead and write two level two questions related to credit card heaven that you would like to use in a discussion that you could speak on. And they put it in the fishbowl and they talk about it. These can go on very familiar with like Socratic seminar, but these are a little more open because the bowl that no one knows who the questions are coming from. They might have initials on them, but a lot of times you have those students who might be apprehensive. They want to get it out there. Nobody knows where they're coming from. And I, I like that opportunity for students to get their voices heard, but not feel intimidated to have their voices heard. So we're just going to look at a quick video on this one. So you can see this in action. Found a great high school fishbowl. In the book, I feel like <laughs> in the book, I feel like we like the culture was predestined for or predetermined. But and like we were like, oh well, that's bad, that's bad. But if we really look at our world, our culture is pretty predetermined for us to like how you're born, where you're born, what time period, whatever, that determines how you're going to act, how, what you're going to dress like, how it's all going to be played out. Yeah, we have our own free will to choose, but in the same way as in the book, it's pretty predetermined for us ourselves. <coughs> well, and in the book, I feel like they felt like they, they kind of had like their own free will. Like, I could take these drugs, or I could not take these drugs, but I like the way these drugs make me feel, and I get to go have sex with everyone, so why would I not take these drugs and screw everyone because we're not? And, um, but, like now, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, they have free will there too, but they just pick what they like, you know, what makes it easier, I guess. I think the alphas had more free will than anybody else. Everybody else was kind of forced to do the things they were doing. But they didn't even notice it because that was just the way things, like, they, nobody had they a broken the mold. Because like, they didn't notice it. They were trained, they were raised, they were But they, like, tricked to themselves into thinking that there was free will. Like, they were like, oh. And like the government was like in there. Right, the government wants them to think that they're making their own choices. Yeah. Here, but they're really not. And I feel like that's probably the same way our world is today. I was going to ask the same question. Like right. the government wants us to think that whatever, we can choose whatever we want to. But with all the media they influence us with and everything, they're basically narrowing our choices. So I'm going to stop it here. You get the gist of it. What I really enjoyed about this is that they referenced the book, they were going back to it. Um, and the one young man just say, oh, that's what I had a question about. They, this was something they weren't afraid to, to get in. And even the ones that were sitting back that looked like they weren't paying attention, like the one that just asked the question, at first he didn't look like he was paying attention. And then, you know, he's like, oh yeah, that's what I want to ask a question about. With the fishbowl discussion, it's a little more laid back than Socratic seminar. But again, just depending on your students and the purpose for the discussion, these are different things because we do want to give them variety. We want to make sure that every other day we're not doing a Socratic seminar and they're like, oh, you know, we, we have to be careful with putting the same thing in front of our students all the time so that they can also grow. We 
really want to push the fact that career and college readiness is right here at our fingertips. Everything that we do, we want to make sure they are going to be prepared for it. And using fishbowl for A's of text, all of that is helping to prepare them. But again, I love the variety. I'm a person who, say if I use fishbowl, I might use it this nine weeks. This might be our end of the unit activity every time. But the next nine weeks, I might use four A's of text. I might use four A's of text every Wednesday. We want to give them that variety so they see that we're going deeper, we're doing a discussion, but at the end of the day, I can pull back because I know they're the ones doing the learning. I know they're the ones that's getting it in. Any questions or anything on fishbowl? Fishbowl is less intimidating because they are able to put in questions or statements anonymously. And when you have students that you trained up, you're comfortable with them. As a teacher, you might know because they might initial the information that they put in the fishbowl or a hat or whatever it is. Then they are sitting there and getting an idea of how to discuss things in a professional way, somewhat like a debate, but laid back. The other thing with fishbowl, there are times when you might have a group that's really responding and the other outer group is watching them like they're in a fishbowl. So it's a lot of different ways that you could do that, but the basic method is to have them to be comfortable and confident with speaking about their views and being able to back it up. When we looked at the video of it, the people kept saying, as it said in the book, or I remember this part, they were completely relying on what they had read. Raise your hand if you've done Four Corners before. Love it, love it, love it. Four Corners, when I've done this with students, a couple of different things I've done. You'll see these up here. We're going to use the classics again, just giving you a topic to think on. So if I were using the classics, I'm not going to have you walk this time, but if I were doing the classics, I'd say, okay, the classics should be taught in every English class. We might have someone who will agree, strongly agree, strongly disagree, and, or disagree. We would have our folks go to each corner. What is wonderful about this is usually you'll have a couple people in every area. You have them talk it through, get a spokesperson, who will then share out to the rest of the group. We have a discussion all over the room, and it goes back and forth. A lot of times if I know I'm about to get into something like, say I think the topic on that fishbowl was something about um, the role in society, I might put out something that children don't have a, a space in society. They should just be here to listen and do. That, that, that's heated, right? Say that to some kids. They should just be here to just listen and do. They have no role in society. We run this, just the adults. They'll probably get up and leave, right? <laughs> so they go to the corners. I might give them a series of questions or statements that then they move around. That's what I love to do. Um, I did a section with the Holocaust. Uh, we were about to do, read a book called The Devil's Arithmetic. And I said, students, please make sure that when you hear the statement that you respond to it, whether agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree, go to your corner. So they would go, they would have a conference, pick a spokesperson, and this went on for about 15 minutes. And then we actually sat down to get into the book. They had a good background, even if they didn't have it before, on what we were getting into. So Four Corners is something that we can use to build background knowledge. We can use it to solidify comprehension. We can use it to review information even before a test. A lot of different ways we can use this. I even put on here, how many of you have seen the question stems from ELA? So we have question stems, okay, we'll have to send them to you, but we have question stems that are associated with every standard to give you an idea of what type of questions would be on FSA. Some of those question stems are written on these posters, so I'm gonna give you a chance to go around and look at those in just a moment. But what's so powerful is that doing four corners even with this, not the agree, disagree, but with the question stems. We have them go over there, we have them talk about it. 
they can even just discuss it and share out or write. So let's take a moment and just disperse. Everybody go to a corner and look at a question stem. Find, well, I could find something. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Even while we're standing, how might you use the question stems with students in your class? Think about a piece of text that you might be using right now. What examples might you have? So I don't know if you guys can read this way over there in your corner, but um, our question stem says, how does the author order the ideas in the text? And so Janet's question was, you know, how could you actually use this in the classroom with the text? And we just took the opportunity to use the text that Janet had shared with us tonight, which was the credit card heaven. So one of the things that, um, you know, I went to immediately was our, I, I felt like our students would immediately just kind of look at that breakdown by paragraph of the ideas that are presented by paragraph because mm -hmm. lots of times they're naturally drawn to do that. And, and then mentioned. my partner shared a much more sophisticated viewpoint. <laughs> well, no, you, said, you know, you could look at it in chunks of, you know, that this was the good thing about it, these were the problems with it, and then the, the end was the ways to prepare yourself or be oh, careful. Okay. Because you could look at chunks and then we That's told you. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the warnings. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like that. And nice. I just talked about what kind of text also would be good with something mm -hmm. like this. And I said anything that has um, a flashback mm -hmm. at the beginning is, oh, yeah. is awesome for this, or it, that has a great deal of foreshadowing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So as we go back to our tables, imagine this with your students. If you were using these question stems, and there's a, I have a sheet with them on there, and I don't know, it's about maybe 20 or so different question stems that we can use with our students to make sure that they see the type of questions that are going to be on FSA, they get familiar with using them. The more we put, it, put them in front of them, the better off they're going to be. If you, how many of you use OneNote and go to our site? Four Corners is not that little game we used to play anymore where everybody just ran the Four Corners. We're talking Four Corners on steroids. We're talking kids going deep with text, with ideas, with foundation of standards, and making sure that at the end of the day, if we're doing all of these structured discussions, if we have the students doing the talking, if we have them digging in and proving that they're the ones that are learning, imagine what kind of people we're going to graduate out of here. Ooh, I got chills, I got chills. Are they going to be college and career ready? Indeed, indeed. All of these go together. All of these structured discussions work together to help our students go deep. This is all about our students doing the work. It also makes me think of something I heard years ago make the kids go home tired and not the teacher. Not physically, we want their brains. We want them to go home and they're like, Phew, man, I was talking so much today and I was thinking so hard. You know, I'm still thinking about that uh, question about credit card heaven that Ms. Harris asked me today and I'm sitting here thinking right now, those FSA questions, I'm going to be really prepared. I'm going to be ready to walk up out of here as a senior, knowing that I know everything I need to know to be successful. It sounds cheesy, but I, I look forward to that. I dream about that, I really do. I am that person who would love to see students rise to being scholars. Four Corners, we had two ways that we could look at it. A lot of times people use it where they have agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and strongly agree. And with students, they go to a corner after a statement has been posed. Sometimes people can give uh, several statements where they have students moving around. But the real idea is for students to then talk about whatever their reason is for being, say, in the agree area, choose a spokesperson, and the whole room shares out. The students also have an opportunity to move around. Maybe they hear something and it's a more valid point, and they might go to the disagree side. So it's really getting that discussion out there, getting students more comfortable with speaking and listening and really understanding. Uh, the other twist that we put onto it, we added question stems, uh, FSA style question stems, where they were able to then look at those question stems and then using the text, find a way to validate those responses to those questions. So Four Corners is not just that little game we used to play when we were running to the Four Corners. It's taking that, something that students are familiar with, and then putting that educational wrap to it. You mentioned at one point 
our 11th and 12th grade students in their work with this. And I was thinking of our 12th grade students who are, in some cases, heading on to a college where they're going to suddenly be faced with a speech class. Mm -hmm. And um, how, in some instances, they have never been exposed to some of these speaking opportunities in the classroom in a high school setting. And so mm -hmm. they come to that challenge absolutely terrified. I'm glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that because I, I wanted to hit on two of those things that oratorical skills was on there. Why do it? Why do these discussions? So we have that positive in interdependence, individual and group accountability. We need that. Uh, we have so many of our kids who are introverts who say, I want to work alone, but they don't know that when they get out there in the real world, they will not have a choice. Yeah. And we are here to help them see that now. That face-to-face -face inter interaction, that diversity of the learning. But more importantly, those oratorical skills, so many of our kids are lacking in that area. Lacking. So we want to make sure that they have that opportunity. And then lastly, I just want to give you some food for thought. When getting ready for structured discussions, here are just a couple of things to think about. This is my number one biggie. You can look at all these, but my reflection. Seeing what I did, how it worked, if it's going to work with the next group. The give one, get one that I do with my first period might be different with the one that I do with my fifth period. It might be called the same, but I know my kids. So again, food for thought. As we move forward, just thinking about the students that we have in front of us, and making sure that we put the best instruction in front of them and making them the center of focus. I think it was an opportunity to reflect. As teachers, we know that we are going to be the sage on the stage. However, we have to learn how to transition. I've met a lot of teachers who are just a little leery about releasing the mic in their classroom. And it's about taking time to reflect and say, what am I doing in my classroom? How am I certain my students are learning if I'm doing all the talking? So it's an opportunity for us to explore some strategies that will help teachers to relinquish the power and allow the students to take center stage. And when we do that, our students are then going to be able to validate the learning and then even validate the instruction that's occurring in the classroom.